stops there. No power of hell, no scheme. I'd like to welcome everybody back to our second hour this morning as we continue to study God's Word. So thankful and grateful for those who um, have been with us, have continued to join us as we uh, look at lessons from God's Word, even during this time. So thankful and grateful again for this opportunity to do so, at least in a manner this way, in a way in which we can uh, study God's Word, in which we can present lessons from it, and, and studies can be done even though we are separate and apart from one another. As Harry talked about this morning, so thankful and, uh, and, and grateful for, for this opportunity, but so looking forward to the opportunity where we can once again meet. We're starting to get some good news where it looks like that is a potential, hopefully in the near future. Um, and uh, whenever that day comes, I know that we will all be rejoicing in it, the ability to see one another, to be with one another, to, uh, to, to worship again in the assembly. For this morning's lesson, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to preach a lesson. Well, let me back up and start first and say, normally I talk with Harry during the week or uh, early in the week about what he's preaching or what he's thinking about, what I have in mind. And for whatever reason, this week I didn't reach out to him. I didn't ask him. It, it, it didn't cross my mind. And so I was putting together my stuff. And he gives me a call yesterday and asked me what I'm preaching on. And I tell him hope. And he said he's preaching on hope as well. And so uh, then we get to talking about it and see the path that each other is going down and recognize and realize that it's not hitting on the exact same points, although on the same topics, so we're going to be hitting around the same type of things. And then he proceeds to tell me, well, you know what, I'm going first, so if anybody's repeating, it's going to be you. And so, uh, you know, he, uh, I, I thought it would work out the other way where the, the rookie here could, uh, could go first and then the other one would, would come in and, and uh, preach second, but... Nonetheless, we'll, uh, we'll continue on and, and go through this, this theme, if you will, that we have uh, for today's uh, sermons that we put together. Uh, Harry did an excellent, great job this morning uh, in that 9 o'clock, or uh, sorry, in the, uh, the, the, the 10 o'clock sermon preaching on, on hope. And I want to continue with that. You know, it's something that has been uh, a theme of some of my sermons in some way, shape, or form, that idea of that. Hope. I talked uh, two sermons ago about opportunities, and one of the things, although it was a, a sub point and a small sub point at that, I talked about re, the the uh, time to reflect and the fact that, that we have these opportunities, and through this would be a good time to reflect, to examine our ways, see if they're in line with the Lord's ways. And one of the things that I brought up is, is you know, reflect on where our hope has been. And then last week I preached on First Peter three fifteen for everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you, and so. We've been going down this path um, from time to time throughout this time. And, and the reason for that is, is because whenever you're going through these situations and, and these trials, one of those things that we often lean upon is hope. And we need to make sure it's the right hope that we're leaning upon. And that's some of the things that we talked about. But, but, but we lean upon that hope. And in particular, what, what we lean upon is the hope that is through Jesus Christ, as we see in 1 Peter 1, 3. And the fact that that hope won't disappoint, as we see in Romans 5, 1 through 5, that that hope is eternal, not a temporal hope. Because if it was a temporal hope, it's something that that, uh, that, that may fade away, may or may not happen, but definitely in is going to fade away. So it's not that grounding hope that's an anchor for the soul that we read about in Hebrews 6, 19. And so we, we make sure that, that we are putting our hope in the right areas. But what I want to hit on this morning is talking about and answering really two questions that could come up as a result of this. Okay, so we've been talking about the fact that, that we need to have our hope and have our hope in the right place, and that's going to help us get through this time. But what we need to understand and recognize, and the questions that, that I want to present this morning are, is really two, twofold. Where is it found? So where is that hope that we're talking about, that hope for eternal life, that hope through Jesus Christ, which is what Harry preached on this morning, where is that hope found? And then second, and apart from that, going along with it is, who has it? So where is this hope found, and who has it? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. The first uh, part of this that I want to look at is, look at where is that hope found? And the answer to that question is, hope is found in the gospel. And we get that from Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. In Colossians chapter 1, we have Paul writing here, starting off his letter to the 
to the brethren there, and he says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. So there's this hope that is laid up for them in heaven. But where did they find it? Of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. And so what we find out from this passage is that hope, that hope laid up for them, for, for them in heaven, that hope of eternal life that is through Jesus Christ. Where did they hear about that? They heard about that in the word of the truth of the gospel. So it is found in the gospel. And not only do we see that it's found in the gospel, this is, but this isn't some. and it was presented to them, but this is something that has gone, <clears throat> excuse me, as we get into verse 6 there, as it is also in all the world. So they heard it. And this gospel is going throughout the world. So that hope that we're talking about, that hope of eternal life, that hope of heaven, that hope that anchors us so that whenever we go through these rough times, we can stay grounded and firm and steadfast. It's found in the gospel, not somewhere else. And we see that whenever we look what the gospel is, this starts to make sense as to why it would be found in the gospel. But let's look at what the gospel is and how it was spread in those types of ideas. So hope is found in the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is read in Mark 16, verse 15, is that message that Jesus told his apostles, his disciples, in the Great Commission to go and preach to all the world. He says in verse 15, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this hope that is found in the gospel is that message, that good news that is taken to the world. That's where hope is found. We see in Matthew's account of the, uh, the, the Great Commission, Jesus said, uh, said there, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pay, pay special attention here to verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The, uh, what... The gospel that was to be taught to the world contains all the things Jesus told us to observe. So that is where hope is found. It is found in the gospel. But one other aspect of it is this. We read in John 16, verses 12 through 14. Jesus says there, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So what Jesus is telling them is there are some things that I have to say to you that you can't bear right now. But he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you. He will glorify me and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And who he's talking to here are his apostles. And he's telling them that there are some things that you are going to be teaching and, and, and taking to the world that I'm, I have not told you. But I am, th th those things are going to come to you whenever the Holy Spirit declares it, delivers it to you. And when did that happen? Well, that happened in Acts chapter 2. We see that event coming true and that all things were given to them. Okay? And so what we're laying out here is this, is hope is found in the gospel. And it's that word that was taken to the whole world. And in it was going to be these things that Jesus told us, to observe as he commanded, and uh, the, the Holy Spirit came and gave them those different things that were to be taken throughout the world and to be taught. But I want us to also understand this. So the Holy Spirit came to them, and so what we get from that is this idea that the Holy Spirit gave them the words of what they were going to say and, and teach it to the world. Well, we find in Second Peter verses one, or chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, that not only was it the words in which they spoke, but that these words were written down. And the words that were written down that we have in the Bible, in, uh, in, in God's word, uh, were not for man, but these were words that are God's words. We read starting in verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. 
For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men spoke, uh, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So whenever they spoke, the things that they said, the things that they wrote down that we have now in writing, they are not their words. These are God's words. Now, God used these men and used their experiences and used their background. But what we understand is these words are the words of God. Okay? So, the word, so hope is found in the gospel. And this gospel was taken and taught to the whole world. And it was written down in God's word. And these words are not the words of men, but they're the words of God. And so now it's starting to make sense. This is why the hope that we are after, the hope of heaven, the hope of being with God, is going to be found in his word. It's not going to be found anywhere else. And that's the idea that we get there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That scripture that was written down is the scripture that comes from God. It was God-breathed. It was not from man's wisdom, from man's thoughts. It's God's It's God's words written down that we may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so as we start to see and recognize and understand this, that what we have here whenever we teach and preach the gospel of Christ, the word, whenever we teach and preach that, this is not man's words. This is not man's wisdom. Where hope is found is in the scripture that comes from God. These are God's words, and that is where hope is going to be. And that's the idea that we had there in Psalm chapter, or sorry, in in the 19th Psalm in verses 7 through 11. Scripture is to be desired. Why? Because scripture comes from God. He starts there in the first part of the Psalm talking about the fact that God created the heavens and the earth, and nobody can deny it. That, 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 that uh, whenever, whenever we look at things, no language uh, is, is, is unheard or any of those types of things. So we understand that this is God's word. It comes from God and it is to be desired. And therefore, that is where our hope is. That is where our hope lies. And I want you to understand why I'm laying this out. Why I'm laying this out is because so many times people want to look for hope and they look for it in some other individual's words. And I'm not necessarily saying, obviously there is the cases where somebody might put their hope in a man and in, in, in that man himself. But what I'm talking about is this. Hope is not found outside of what has been revealed or written. It's not in something that a pastor, minister, uh, minister or a cardinal or, or whoever you might go to. It's not. It doesn't come from his wisdom or his thoughts. Where hope is found is in the gospel of Christ. You don't find hope that allows you to be anchored elsewhere. Hope is found in Christ's gospel. Hope is found in God's word. If the hope that I am looking for, if the hope I am looking for comes from God, then where am I going to go to look for that? I'm not going to turn to some man or some other book or some other thought that I might have. I'm going to turn to his word to find it. And the reason why I laid out what I did there is because the gospel in in, in which this hope is found was taken to all the world. And these men that took it to all the world and taught it were men who were inspired, who, who were given the words to say and to teach by Jesus himself. And then whatever he didn't give them from the Holy Spirit. And then not only that, but that those things were written down. And whenever those things were written down, they weren't written down from the words of men. These are God's words. And so we lay all that out to understand the importance of this. There might be those who say that you can't trust this, that this is outdated, that that these aren't God's exact words, that that, that they're merely uh, his thoughts. And so because of that, there's room for error in God's word. And there's some things that you might be able to trust and other things that, that, that you can't. You can't. Brethren, that is not how this works. This is God's word, and that is where hope is, and that is where you turn to. And I don't want it to sound like I'm saying you don't go to anybody else for advice if you're struggling. We see that throughout Scripture. 
that, I mean, you, you, you look at Psalm 1, and Psalm 1 talks about the fact that you don't go after wise, or sorry, uh, ungodly counsel. You turn in delight and desire in God's word. And so no doubt if somebody is one, an individual that desires in God's word, you can seek them for help. You can seek them, but don't go to the ungodly. Don't go to unwise counsel. Make sure you're turned into that counsel that is in the word of God. And whenever you do go to men, whenever you do go to an individual that, that, that you think highly of, whenever you do go to an individual that, uh, that, that, that you believe is somebody who uh, studies God's word and knows God's word, don't just take them at their word for it, but check everything they say with Scripture. That is your basis. Why? Because that is where hope is found. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who try to find hope and, and even want to seek the hope um, uh, of heaven and eternity and all these different types of things. They, they, they seek that, that eternal reward, but they're not turning to God's word to find that hope. They're turning somewhere else to find it. They're turning to uh, some writing by a man, or they're turning to that man or individual themselves. And as a result of that, there is room for error. Brethren, there is not going to be error whenever you turn to the gospel. The hope that we are looking for is the hope that God provides. If that's the case, then we're going to turn to his word to find out what it says and how to obtain it. So understand that and understand how important that is. And, and, and just one other thought while we're on this point of hope and hope being found in the gospel. You know, so hope is found in the gospel. And we read in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, that Paul marveled at the fact that the brethren there at Galatia had turned so soon to a different gospel. Understand that he's not saying that they uh, had the gospel and that they turned to Buddhism or they turn to Hinduism, or they turn to Islam, or something completely separate and apart from Christianity, to the gospel of Christ. What he talks about throughout the letter is the fact that there were those of the, uh, of, uh, there, there were Jews, the Judaizing teachers, who were going and influencing and teaching the fact that circumcision was a requirement, that that was something that you had to do. In particular, they were teaching the Gentiles this. That, that, that um, yes, Christ came, but circumcision was still something you had to do. Paul's saying that that's a different gospel that you turn to. And so I just want us to think about this. And, and, and after that, what he does is he goes into and he, he talks about the fact that the gospel comes from one source. That gospel comes from one source that, 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 that it was uh, what was given to you. And if an angel or even if I come and teach and preach something different, then you're not to accept it. And so I just want you to think about that and let that sink in and, and, and maybe read through that account and think about along with that Ephesians chapter 4 verses 3 through 6. Whenever Paul was talking about the fact that there is one faith and in that he also talks about the fact that there was one hope. He, he, he mentions uh, uh, some other things but the whole idea there is there's to be this unity and there is a oneness that is there. If this is the fact that Paul is talking about that there is one hope, there is one faith, that he's uh, condemning these brethren for turning away so soon to a different gospel outside of that which was given to him, something that was taught by somebody else. Again, not something completely separate or apart from Christianity, not, not, or, or from, from the gospel that, that he delivered. There were still some of those foundations there, but they were adding things to it. Then why do we have so many different churches today? that teach different things, different gospels. Our hope is to be found in the gospel, but yet we have different ways and in, 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 in different uh, people out there teaching differently that gospel. Is that okay? Many people say you can join the, <clears throat> excuse me, join the church of your choice and all those types of ideas. You know, something that we'll look to study at a later date, but it's something whenever we think about the fact that the hope that we are looking for through this time, that hope that grounds us, that hope that keeps us, that, 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 that keeps us solid, <clears throat> that allows us to be consistent through this time. That hope is found in the gospel, yet we have people teaching many different gospels today. It's not that gospel that was delivered in God's word. 
And the reason why we say that is because there's different teachings. There was one there. Well, again, we'll look at that at a later date, but just kind of want to want you to think about that as we look at this idea of hope being found in the gospel, yet we have multiple gospels being taught. We have multiple things being taught. And, some, and one, one might say, wait a minute, it's not multiple gospels. Then why is it different things? Why do we believe different things from that same gospel? It's not going to be the case. God's not the author of confusion. Yeah, we all have the same hope. Man, that's a question we'll look at at a later date. But just wanted to kind of throw that out there and, and, and want you to think about that and ponder on that and read that, re- read those sections of scriptures um, while we're on this topic. So not only is hope found in the gospel, that's where we go to find it. We don't go somewhere else. We don't go to some other man or, 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 or some other um, reading. We go to the gospel to find that hope. But we read about that one who has hope, and really what hope does, and this is somewhat of what Harry was talking about this morning, is that one who has hope purifies himself. There is something demanded of that individual who has hope, and we read that here in 1 John chapter 3. John writing here says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, which hope? The hope to see him as he is, purifies himself just as he is pure. You recognize that? If we are going to be ones who have hope, Not only is that hope found in the gospel, but that hope of eternal life, that hope to see Jesus as he is, that hope to be with him, that what is demanded of that individual? That he just doesn't do anything with his life? No, he purifies himself. And that idea of of purifying yourself is expanded upon as far as how we do that in 1 Peter 1, chapter 20, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. We read there, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all glory of man is at this and, and all glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the gospel, which, uh, now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Understand that? We purify ourselves by obeying the truth through the Spirit. And understand where that is down there in verse 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. We purify ourselves by obeying the truth that is the gospel or the word of God. That's, where, that's how one purifies himself. That's where he turns to. In order to be purified, it's not that I don't do absolutely nothing. I have to do something. I obey that truth. That is how Peter is talking to those here and how they were purified. Since you purified your souls in obeying the truth. And he says uh, um, again, uh, that, that idea through the word of God, which abides forever, verse 23. Okay? So, one who has hope is one who purifies himself. And how do they do that? They do that through the obeying of truth. That is demanded. It's demanded that we go and that we obey truth. But I want you to see that John continues and, and, and he expounds on this idea of purifying yourself. He says in verse 4 of uh, chapter 3, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. One of the things that I do want to point out before we move on and, con- and consider 
a, a little bit more of what that idea of purifying yourself might mean or might, what, what would be and would look like, uh, we need to understand this. The only reason why we can be and become pure is because Jesus was pure and in him there is no sin. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm presenting the idea that we were born in sin, which many believe with that idea of Calvinism that we were born uh, with sin and there was nothing that we can do. That, 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 uh, it wasn't that we sinned and brought that sin upon us, but this is something that was inherited from Adam's sin. That's not taught in Scripture. That's not the idea in the path that I'm going down. What we see is in Ezekiel is the idea that the soul who sins is the one that should die. Whenever we sin, we're the ones that bring that upon ourselves. It's not the idea that I, that, that I inherited sin or even like the audience that John is talking to here, uh, who he's trying to debate with and against, which is the Gnostic teachers that think that all matter is evil and therefore uh, it, it, it's, it, it's just sinful. That matter is sinful and therefore my body is sinful and that there's nothing that we can do. That's not the path that I'm going down. We see that Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 that, uh, you know, uh, whenever we commit sin and, uh, and those type of things, that our iniquity separated us from God. And then in Romans 3.23, that all men have sinned. Again, not the idea of that uh, um, I inherited Adam's sin, but the idea that I have sinned, that man sins and therefore separates himself from God. And so what we get here from John is this. Hope purifies, uh, what, the, the one who has hope purifies himself, but the reason why we have the ability to do that after we have sin is because Jesus was manifested to take away our sins, and the reason why he was able to do that is because in him there was no sin. You know, we see in John chapter 3, verse 16, that that's why uh, God sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was sent. In order that whenever he, uh, the, Jesus was sent, and whenever he lived his perfect life, and there was no sin in him, and he died the death on the cross that he did, and he was raised again to walk in newness of life, now we have that hope that we won't perish, but that we can have everlasting life as well. I mean, really what we see there is that idea is that God sent Jesus so that we can have hope. Without Jesus, there was no hope. We need to understand that. We need to recognize that. That's what Harry was talking about whenever he looked at Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Whenever we look at Ephesians chapter 2, reading verses 11 through 13, Paul's saying this, uh, you know, uh, given this idea, he says, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made the flesh without hands, that at that time you were without Christ being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers, uh, from the covenant of the promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so what we see here and what we recognize and what we realize is this. What we recognize and realize is that without Jesus, there would be no hope. But because Jesus came, lived the life that he did, died the death that he did, we have hope. There is hope. And it's not just a hope that, that, that is only for certain people. This is a hope that is available to all men. In fact, that's what John is saying there in 1 John. Uh, let me flip over there. In 1 John chapter 2, if you back up into verses, uh, or sorry, start 1 John 2, ver uh, verses 1 and 2, we read, My little children... These things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. And who's that advocate? Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The idea that we see there is that the whole world, everybody has that opportunity to enter in to that hope. But, you know, many people would stop there and start thinking to themselves, okay, so I have that hope through Jesus Christ, so therefore I don't need to do anything. Jesus lived the perfect life. In him there was no sin. He was manifested for me. All those types of ideas. They'd even go over to John 3, 16, say, see, all I got to do is believe. I don't need to do anything else. Wait a minute. We just looked at the first part of 1 John uh, chapter 3, 
uh, whenever we're looking there and says that he who has hope purifies himself. And that idea of purifying oneself, as we see in 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, isn't obeying the truth. And so there must be something that I have to do. But what I, what I want to expound on is this idea that this does not mean that I can go on in my life sinning. Again, that was something. That, and, and, and to think that that's what this letter in this book is teaching goes completely against the context of who John is trying to fight against. He's trying to fight against the Gnostic teachers. Again, those who believe that matter is evil. And as a result of that, the human body is evil. Okay? And, and there were many different variations of Gnostic teaching, but it, there, it appears to be apparent that he's attacking two in particular here. They, they believe that Jesus was not both man and God, that he couldn't be because the body is inherently sinful, so Jesus couldn't be here in literal flesh. That's why John starts off the chapter talking about the fact that we saw him, that he was, and that we are witnesses for him or for that. But not only that, he gets into the fact talking about uh, it be, because of that, because they believe that, the logical conclusion that one would come to is my body then is inherently sinful because it's evil, because matter is evil, and therefore I'm going to keep on sinning in my life. There's a separation and distinction between body and spirit. And so, uh, I, I mean, uh, as far as that goes, and so while my soul or while my body can keep sinning, my soul can now be uh, sin free. See, that was the idea of the Gnostic teachers, and they claimed to have this enlightened knowledge that others didn't have. That's what John was fighting against. John was fighting against that, and so what he's not saying is the fact that we can keep on sinning. In fact, what he's telling them is the fact that one who, um, uh, who, who has that hope, he doesn't keep sinning. He stops sinning. He purifies himself by obeying the truth. And then he goes on and says uh, in verse 6, Whoever abides in him does not sin. That is, he does not continue to sin. And, what, and, and, and what, what, what we see from that idea of abiding in him, we can go back to the gospel account of John. In John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, ver, reading verses 5 through 10. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. Again, going back to that idea that without Christ, without him becoming that perfect sacrifice and being manifested for us, we have no hope. But through him, we can. But what do we got to do? We got to abide in him. If anyone abides in me, picking up here in verse 6, uh, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they are gathered, um, withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. See, to this point, he's saying, all right, you need to abide in me and I'll abide in you. And so we're all on the same page. Okay, that's good. But what does that mean to abide in him? What it means to abide in him is is told to us here in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask and uh, you will ask what you desire. And it shall be done for you by this. My father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. What I want us to understand is this is the way that we abide in Jesus is by abiding in his words and doing his words. And in fact, if we aren't, if we don't, then what does he say happens? If we don't abide in him, which is abiding in his words, we're going to be cast aside. We're going to be ones that uh, are like those vines uh, in those branches who aren't abiding. They wither and they are gathered and thrown into the fire and they are burned. They are destroyed. In other words, that one that doesn't abide in him is one that doesn't have the hope. They have a false hope. They, 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 they might claim to have hope, but it's a false hope because they're not abiding in him like they should. But I want you to continue on with me and see that Jesus even gives an example of what it means to abide in one. As he abided, as he was abiding in the Father and in the Father's love, he says in verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Just, pay attention here, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus gives us the example of what it means to abide in. What it means to abide in is to not claim to and then go on and disobey. No, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And in order to abide in him, we have to abide in his words by keeping his commandments just as he said he did. He abided in the Father by keeping the Father's commandments. And I want you to, to, to think back where we started. Jesus was pure, just as he is pure. That's how we are to be pure, right? 
As he is pure, we are to be pure. And he was manifested for us because in him there was no sin. Well, how was that the case? What did he do? He abided in the Father's commandments and did not sin. He did not neglect them. He did not go against them. And that's what I want to point out whenever we go back to verse 4. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Well, sin, as we see in verse 4, is committing lawlessness. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is that idea of being without law. Not keeping the Father's commandments as we see explained in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. And Jesus explains this in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those who practice lawlessness or sin will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who practice lawlessness are the, those that are not keeping the Father's commandments. They are doing that which is without law. They are sinning, which is completely antithetical to what Jesus did. What Jesus did is he kept the Father's commandments. That was our example. And, in order, and, he, and whenever he did that, he says, I, have, I was abiding in him. In order for us to abide in him, we need to keep his commandments as well. So what we can't do is we can't keep and continue on in this life sinning. See, that's something that a lot of people don't understand. There's a lot of people that want to go down the path and, 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 uh, and present this idea of continual cleansing that I can just keep on living my life and I don't need to be so worried about sin. It's not, that big, it's not that big of a deal, all those types of things. If I don't keep the Father's commands, that's completely going against what John's laying out here and what we see one who has hope does. One who has hope purifies himself and he does not sin. He abides in Jesus. Whenever he abides in Jesus, he abides in his law and he keeps his commandments. He does not sin. And when you look at these examples that are here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, they practice lawlessness is what he told them. They're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Were these just the evil of the world from the standpoint of they're just out killing people? No. These are people who thought that they were doing right, but they weren't. Why? Because they weren't keeping his law. They weren't abiding in him as they should. One who has hope is the one who purifies himself. And again, I want to stop right here and remind everybody, this is what we're understanding and this is what we're seeing in Scripture, but what we also recognize is this is for everybody. Everybody has this opportunity to have this hope. Everybody has this opportunity to live there, to purify themselves in this manner, and everybody has this opportunity to practice righteousness as we see in verse 7. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Again, remember, keep in context who he's talking to. He's talking to those who have been um, have, have uh, had their faith in the world somewhat rocked by the Gnostic teachings. And so what he's reminding them is, little children, I want you to remember something. Don't let these Gnostic teachers or anyone else deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Not this one who claims to have this higher knowledge, this higher understanding than you do, that, that the body is sinful and really it's just about the soul and all these different types of things and they're separate and apart. And even though they sin in this life, their soul is right and all this type of things. No, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness, that's the one who is righteous just as he is righteous. Practicing righteousness, that which is right and therefore acceptable to God. You know, we kind of see this idea of righteousness coming back up and practicing righteousness. And really, the, the, the concept and the idea that is presented in Romans 6, and here he didn't quote this exact verse, but he was in Romans 6 this morning, is that idea of being a slave to righteousness. And I want you to, to go over there with me, if you will, into Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. We read, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died live any longer in it? 
You see, there are those out there going back to that idea of a continual cleansing that I was talking about that, that want to claim that the type of things that I'm talking about diminishes the grace of, uh, of God, diminishes the grace of Christ. And they say, well, do you really believe in grace? Yes, I believe in grace wholeheartedly. But what grace doesn't do is grace doesn't give me a license to continue in sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And whenever he goes throughout this chapter, what he's talking about, and really the idea that you get is you used to be a slave to sin, but now that you've been baptized into Christ and rise to walk in new life, you are now a new creature. You're no longer a slave to sin. Don't keep sinning. You are now a slave to righteousness, and that's the idea that we see whenever we uh, go ahead a little bit into verses 15 through 18. He repeats himself once again about being a uh, uh, Continue in sin so grace may abound. It says, what, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, that you are that one slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, of obedience leaving, uh, leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, see, you used to be slaves to sin, yet you obeyed, which was, that's what we talked about, until you purify yourself in First Peter uh, two, uh, uh, 21 through 25, whenever we were looking there. But uh, which, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine of which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you're no longer a slave to sin. You do become a slave to something, though, that being a slave to righteousness. In other words, you're going to practice righteousness. You're not going to keep on sinning. You're not going to keep on living a life of sin. What you are now going to do, the one who has hope, is one who has purified themselves in the sense that they are no longer one living a life of sin. They're not going to continue in sin. They are now going to be living a life of righteousness and living a life in that way. When we see the idea of Psalm 1, verse 6, it gives us so much hope, so much um, confidence in God. When we see there in Psalm 1, verse 6, the Lord knows the righteous. He knows the way the righteous, but the ungodly shall perish. So you need to be one that's practicing righteousness. You need to be one that's practicing what's right. You cannot continue to live a life of sin and then claim that you have this continual cleansing of Christ's blood. Going back to that, that, that idea of grace, grace doesn't give me a license to sin. It does not give me a license to keep living a life of sin. I believe in grace. Grace is, 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 is something that, 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 was, that was given to us so that we have this hope of heaven. Without Jesus, we don't have that hope as we establish. But grace does not permit us to continue to live our life and do whatever it is that we want to do. Again, that whole context is you were a slave to sin. You were baptized into Christ. You rise to walk in a new life. You are now a new, create, a new creature. You, you, you are now born again. You do not continue to live that life of sin. You don't continue to go down that path. So one who has hope is one who purifies himself. He obeys that gospel. Whenever he does that, he understands that it's not anything that I did, that it was because Christ was perfect, but because of that, I am now going to live for him and not live a life of sin. So that's kind of the what 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 we see, or the, you know that that that's what we see here, and that's the idea that we have. You see, hope is not found anywhere else. Hope is found in the gospel, and the gospel teaches if you have purified yourself and are living, or if you have not purified yourself rather and are living in sin and lawlessness, you have a false hope. You might have hope. But if you have not purified yourself and you're continuing to live in sin and you're unwilling to get rid of it and get out of it, then you are one who has a false hope, regardless of the intentions. Again, I take you back to Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Those weren't people who were, uh, from, the, from what it appears in the context that we're getting, that were intentionally going through and just... Um, uh, uh, being the most evil of the evil. In fact, it was a gospel that was written to the Jews that were to be ones that were to be spiritually minded in some way, shape, in or form. They were to be in that way. We're talking about people who were practicing that which was 
law, uh, w- w- which was not right. We're not talking about the most evil of evil. In fact, the, the, the idea that we get there is that they had every intention to do what was right. They were casting out demons in the Lord's name and all those different things, but they weren't doing it according to the commandments of the Lord. And as a result of that, they were ones who were told uh, that they were not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Many believe they have hope, but they are not practicing and obeying truth that's found in the gospel and thus are not pure. Everything you do and practice, whether that's your worship or your daily life, must be in accordance with the gospel. What we need to understand is that is the truth. What you do in your life needs to be in accordance with God's word. You might be wrong. Your grandparents might be wrong. Your pastor, your minister, your parents, they might be wrong in what they have taught you. What we need to do is we need to be ones who are humble enough to understand that and recognize that, to not get too proud, to not let pride get in the way, and to turn to God's word. And if what we have heard and what we have been taught is truth, then we continue in it. But if not, then we need to make the changes according to the gospel because that is where true hope lies. We might, uh, you might be you know, found to be practicing something else, and if you are, that's a false hope that you have. And that's something that we need to understand. And the reason why I wanted to preach this sermon and bring this out is because this. I've been laying out and telling uh, everybody through God's word that to help us get through this time, we need to have hope. And we need to lean on God. And we need to, we, we, we need to have that be our anchor for the soul. But you've got to understand what that means. The individual who can truly do that is one whose hope is founded in the gospel and God's word. And as a result of that has made the application to their life to where they're no longer sinning. And so if whenever you look at God's word, you find something that you are doing is called sin, you need to stop it. And you cannot continue in it. If you do, it's a false hope that you're holding on to. That's not the hope Jesus tells us about that John reveals in his gospel, the one that God, or that John reveals in his letter that he was inspired by God. I want to wrap up with this. Again, that understanding of what Harry talked about, that even though we laid out there where hope is found and those individuals who have hope, what it demands, that opportunity is open for all. We see in 2 Peter 3, 9, that God wants all to come to repentance. Because of that, that's why we have today. In that context and in that chapter, what it's talked about is the fact that you see, Jesus hasn't returned, and so there's people that are mocking him. And Peter tells him, oh, he's going to return. But God is long-suffering. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And so because of that, he hasn't returned. And because we have today, that lets us know that the long-suffering is there. And God has given us yet another opportunity, another moment, another day to come to repentance. But with that said, right after that, he goes into verse 10 and says, But of that day, whenever the Lord returns, nobody knows. He's going to come as a thief in the night. And the idea that we get there is this. While God wants all to come to repentance, there's going to come a time where there's not going to be any more long-suffering. And the judgment day will be here. The ones who found their hope in the gospel and that are hearing to it, made the application to their life. Those are going to be ones that are ready for that day. Those who aren't, have not done that, they're not going to be ready for it. So it's out there, and it's available for all. And all have that advocate, as we talked about in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, all have the advocate of Jesus. And it's for the world. It's not just for a select group of people. Everybody has that opportunity. But you've got to come. And, and, and live your life according to that gospel and to that message. You know, I don't want to leave here, especially this being the last hour this morning that we'll present a lesson without talking about just real quickly and laying out where hope starts. You know, we talked about the hope is, uh, comes from the one who purifies himself. The one who has hope purifies himself just as he is pure. And then we read in First Peter that that hope is from obeying the truth that is found in the gospel. We found and we read in Mark chapter 15, verses, verse 15, the uh, understanding there of what the gospel was, that it was that message that Jesus wanted to be proclaimed to the world. It's that doctrine, that message that was sent out there. And we read in verse 15 that it's to be taken to all the world. But what we read there 
uh, in uh, verse 16, I'm sorry, I think I said Mark 15, I meant Mark 16. What, what we read there in uh, Mark 16, verses uh, 15 and 16, he tells them to go into all the world, preach and teach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. You see what's a part of that gospel? A part of that gospel, in order to have hope, is whoever believes it and is baptized. That's the one that will be saved. You know, that same gospel that was given to them that we read at the end of the gospel accounts, especially in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that was preached in the first gospel sermon in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And there you had these people in, verse, uh, in, in Acts chapter 2 who were being taught, and they were told what had happened. They were told that they had, murder, that, that they had murdered the Son of God, that they had murdered Jesus Christ. And they quickly come to an understanding that they're separate and apart. They have no hope. They're in a dire situation. What do we need to do? And what does Peter tell them? In fact, that, that, that's what it says. They were cut to the heart, the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do is what they said to the, Peter and the rest of the apostles. And Peter answered them in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, remiss, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see there? Not only was it told to them, the message that they are to preach, but then throughout the book of Acts, that's the exact message that they preach. He who believes and is baptized is the one that shall be, shaved, shall be saved. That's the one that has hope. We see a similar example in Acts chapter 9. See, it's not just here in Acts chapter 2. People might say, oh, that's the only place you can go to. No, you can go throughout every example of the book of Acts. And you look at Acts 9, you look at the conversion of Paul. The one who formerly was called Saul was persecuting the church uh, and, and, and was persecuting those of the way, as the scripture says. He's on the road uh, to Damascus, and what do we see? We see Christ appearing to him. Paul realized, uh, and, and, and Christ appears to him, and, uh, you know, uh, t- tells, uh, you know, a light shines forth and everything like that. And Paul quickly realizes who it is. He's told who it is. And then he realizes and understands he's apart from that. He doesn't have hope. And so he asked him in verse 6, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? I understand my situation, that I have been persecuting you, that I don't have hope at this point in time. Is there anything that I need to do? Or is it just going to happen to me? What does Jesus tell him? Jesus tells him to go into the city there in verse 6. Uh, he, uh, he says, then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do do you told there what you must do there's something you were going to have to do you know i was having to study with my um four six and eight year old this week and it wasn't hard for them to understand what that meant be told to you what you must do i asked them what does that mean what if i told you you must do something and my little six-year-old girl was like that means i have to do it even a little kid can understand that it'll be told to you what you must do there well what was that must that he had to do whenever paul recounts this In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, he tells them, this is what I had to do. And an eyes told him, and now why are you awaiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There's a question. What must I do to have hope? Is there something they have to do? Yeah, that's a must. Must means have to. Okay, what is that? Paul had to arise and to be baptized, washing away his sins. That's where we are. That's what you need to do. We also see in 1 Peter 3.21 that there is now an antitype which now saves us, that being baptism. Baptism is where that hope is going to start. If you have not been baptized into Christ, being immersed for the remission of your sins, you are one right now that has either no hope or a false hope. Now, you can obtain that because as we've laid out this morning, That hope is available for all, but that hope that is available for all, the all must come into accordance with that gospel, that message, and that message is you need to be baptized. And then from that point forward, as we go back to 1 Peter, in fact, right after we get to the end of 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, he then goes on and says, well, you've done this, therefore grow thereby, grow by the word. That's what you must do. If you haven't done that yet, then you're not leaning upon a hope that is real, that is truly going to found, that, that, that's true, that's going to keep you grounded and founded through all these situations that we go through.
The good news is you can. You can start that walk right now. Being baptized for the remission of your sins, repenting of your sins and being baptized for the remission of them, and then walking, rising to walk in newness of life, not continuing to sin anymore, to understand that grace and that love of Jesus and God that they gave us. And as a result of that, you now live and walk in a life of righteousness. You now become a slave to that righteous living. If you have any need for that gospel call this morning, please get in contact with Harry or I. We'll be more than willing to do what we need to do to be able to help you be baptized this day. Because we're not guaranteed the next day as we saw in 2 Peter 1. Or sorry, 2 Peter 3, verses 10, verse 10. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know when Christ is going to re- return. We don't know when our life is on this earth is going to end. So don't wait another moment. Get in contact with us. If you're one that has fallen away or ha- has done that, you've been baptized, but you've been falling away, you've continued to live this life of sin, i tell you there is that provision that we see there whenever we look at 1 John. Whenever we look at 1 John and look in verse 9, We're not to continue to live in sin. We're not to be ones that live in sin. But he says, if we confess our sins, one sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You need to do that. You can, maybe it's something of of a private manner you can take care of yourself. Maybe it's something you need some help and need to talk to one of the elders or, uh, you know, Harry or I. Please get in contact with us this day. That hope we have is that hope that no doubt grounds us. It's that hope that helps us get through this life. It's that hope that regardless of the situation, whether we're going through suffering, whether we're going through trials and temptations and tribulations, or whether we're living a life that uh, at that point in time things are going our way, we can be that consistent individual because we have that hope that is founded not in our knowledge, not in some other man's wisdom, but found in the gospel. And that hope. It can keep us steadfast and grounded. I hope this sermon and I hope this study this morning was helpful, was beneficial to you. If you have any questions, concerns, want to talk about these things, these matters, please get into contact with me, get in contact with Harry or one of the members of the congregation. I promise you we'll be willing to have a Bible study with you to sit down with open Bibles. I hope you have a great rest of your Lord's Day, and uh, God bless.